We've seen how standardization can help you automate your security program, but it can also simplify your compliance efforts. Standardization is important for repeatability, process improvement, policy enforcement, and audits. The key to this consistency is repeatable pipelines. The CI pipeline is your software assembly line. It should be standardized for consistent outcome and measured for ongoing improvement. When policies are applied automatically, and exceptions documented. Your compliance efforts are simplified and you get end-to-end visibility on who changed what, where, when, and how. Nico Mesenhall with White Duck is a frequent speaker and together with Philippe Lafoucrier from GitLab, they will cover standardization and compliance within the CI pipeline in even greater detail. Welcome everyone to this uh, GitLab Commit presentation. Happy to see you here today. Our topic today is going to be how to enhance your compliance and governance with a policy-based CI CD. I'm uh, Philippe Lafoucrière. I'm today, uh, I'm with uh, Nico. Nico, if you want to briefly introduce yourself. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Nico Meisenthal. I'm Senior Cloud and DevOps Consultant at WhiteDuck. Um, I'm basically doing stuff around Cloud Native and Kubernetes and containers. Thanks, Nico. Our agenda today will be divided into three sections. Uh, we will try to introduce very briefly what is uh, compliance and governance, especially in CI-CD. Uh, then Nico will talk to you about OPA, the Open Policy Agent, and how it's working. And hopefully, we will have some time for a couple of demos. So before we jump in, um, let's try to define what is compliance. It's going to be easier to understand this uh, this talk. I found this very short and brief description on on Wikipedia, and I just love the the, the way it's uh, defining compliance. It's adherence to standards, regulations, and other requirements. Hopefully, you will uh, find a lot more definitions outlined, but this one is uh, short enough to understand what is. Uh, compliance and what we are talking about. In other words, for me, compliance is uh, say what you do and do what you say. Um, there are many reasons why you would need or want to add compliance to your process and pipelines. Uh, of course, uh, the first one that comes to mind is the regulatory compliance or statu statutory sorry, uh, compliance. Um, you can think here about frameworks and uh, for the statutory parts, there are local and international laws, uh, especially in the US, you have state and federal and international laws. So a lot of, um, of uh, requirements um, that uh, the, the, the state is going to enforce you to, to follow. Um, also for standards, uh, you can think of web standards. Like, for example, if you are developing a browser like Firefox or Chrome, you might want to be compliant with the web standards. So that's something that you will automate at some point and you, you will want to maintain that level of compliance as you do develop and, and ship some new versions. Uh, you could have also some obligations with your vendors or customers, uh, like could be shipping the software without any known vulnerabilities, for example. And uh, this is, I insist, this is not a unit test. It's not something that we're testing with the software itself. It's around the software, but we will get back to this uh, notion a bit later. Uh, and last but not least, you could have some corporate policies uh, that you will want to enforce. There are more or less guidelines, but sometimes you really want to enforce them. Um, and that's uh, a good example. Uh, for example, at GitLab, we have the handbook, uh, which defines a lot of processes and, and guidelines. And we like to use these as policies so that we can enforce that later and make sure that everyone is doing the, the required things the same way. Depending on your industry, you might need to comply to specific frameworks, like, for example, uh, HIPAA for the S. Uh, health industry or PCI DSS for payments with cards. Um, we won't go into details with these frameworks. Just remember that they exist and you might need, again, depending on your industry, to comply to them. On your way to compliance, uh, compliance is not the first thing that you will set up in your company. It's even probably the last. There are many steps in preparation uh, 
before doing compliance. Of course, like usual, uh, automation is key. As the company matures, the testing and quality workflows will as well and offer a foundation to get to the compliance level. We can do all of these things without compliance, but doing compliance without them will turn out to be extremely hard. So they are intimately tied together. And now comes the part with uh, compliance and governance uh, in the CI CD. Uh, if you wonder what's the difference between compliance and governance, I think the difference, and I like to define it this way, compliance is more like taking the boxes, taking off the boxes, whereas compliance uh, whereas governance sorry, is understanding and managing the risk. So obviously they are also intimately uh, tied together, um, but there's a very slight difference between the two. So in the CI CD, what it means to have a compliance, it means that you define the how around the what in the pipelines. What I mean by that is it's not only uh, what you are developing uh, in your pipeline, it's also how you are doing it. So the for example, the base Docker images that you are using or the, the whole process in itself, how you are shipping, who is involved and all the kind of things. It could be also security or compliance gates. Uh, if something is failing, you can have uh, some jobs that will make the whole pipeline fail because you're not meeting the requirements. And so that's a great way to do that in the CI CD pipeline because you ensure that these requirements are always made during all the life cycle of the project. So it's not something that you do once a month, it's something that you do all the time as your project is living. And of course, that's one of the GitLab values and probably my favorite, my personal favorite. Iteration is key, start small, don't try to do everything at once. Uh, OPA will be a great helper uh, with this process and we will see no why with Nico. Nico, up to you. Thanks, and thanks for the great intro on compliance and, and governance with CICD. Um, so now I would like to shift to a more technical part and, and show you what OPA, so Open Policy Agent is, um, how you can use it and how you can integrate it um, into your CICD and we will then follow up with, with some demos. Okay, so um, talking about OPA. Um, so basically, if you, when you go to the OPA uh, website, um, you will find the sentence policy based control for cloud native environments. Uh, basically, OPA is a general purpose policy engine, which you can use across yeah, the whole ecosystem or across your own stack. Um, so it's not limited to just one use case. So if you maybe heard about open policy agent in the Kubernetes space, um, it's a lot more than just doing policy in Kubernetes. So we can basically use it everywhere. Um, and I will give you some details in, in just a minute. Um, so OPA is also a created CNCF project. Um, so it's part of CNCF ecosystem and got introduced by, by Styra um, some years ago. Um, with OPA, you will become an, or you will get a declarative policy language, which you can use to basically define um, your policies and then validate them and verify them with, um, with OPA. Um, one uh, very nice thing of OPA is that you can decouple your application logic um, from your policy decision. So basically your application is just hosting um, your yeah your um, business logic. And then you have basically a thing, a site like open policy agents, which is really doing and enforcing and validating um, policies. So how it's done that is that your application is just talks to OPA, um, maybe brings in some, some details, then OPA will decide if something is okay or not okay, and will provide your application um, some kind of feedback. Um, to integrate with, you have multiple options. You can, first of all, use a REST API and run OPA um, as a sidecar if you're in a containerized world or just as a, as a daemon if you're based on virtual machines or so. Um, if you um, build your application or your, your tool or something in Golang, you can also just use the Golang library um, the OPA project provides. Um, and for other use cases, you also have a um, WebAssembly module, which you can also use um, to build your policies in. Um, and then beside of this, OPA also provides you with some APIs, um, which helps you yeah, in the life cycle, which helps you to, to, to manage OPA, to get some metrics, details, stuff like this. You uh, have other option to provide OPA with some further input data, but it's also something I will talk in just a minute. Um, so this is just the basic of, of OPA. 
as I said, Opera has a really, really big ecosystem. So you can use it with Kubernetes, but you can also use it just with yeah, your virtual machines, maybe doing SSH validation. Um, you can use it in service meshes uh, to decide which uh, application is allowed to talk to another application. You can use it in your APIs and, and web apps and doing authorization. Um, you can do, use it as we will do in the demo later with CICD. So you have multiple um, options where you can use um, OPA, um, yeah, and use the f features and functionalities of the general proposed um, policy agent. Um, yeah, some more details on the ecosystem. As I said, you can do API service authorization, um, for example, with Envoy, with Kong, with traffic, and, and others. Um, you can do authorization for maybe Kafka or SQL um, databases. Um, you can integrate it in, in service measures like Istio or Linkerd. Um, you can use it for infrastructure as code changes, which we'll do later in the demo um, with Terraform. Um, or just for Linux machines to decide which user is allowed to, to access a machine with SSH or which user is allowed to do um, in sudo or something. And of course, um, you can also use it for policies and governance with, with Kubernetes, uh, but this is one example. And this is a, just a small list. So I included some uh, the link with further, uh, further integrations of the ecosystem. So it's a really, really long list of integration points, which is really great. So talking about OPA and how it works. Um, so let me bring up the laser here. Um, so basically, um, we will have any kind of request. Doesn't matter at all. So we have a request, and the request um, um, is sent to any kind of service. Doesn't matter for now. So basically, something is talking to our service. And then our service um, sends some kind of data um, to, to OPA to yeah, validate. Um, this kind of data doesn't matter. So it's basically everything OPA will need to decide whether it's okay or not okay. Um, the only thing you will need to be aware of is needs to be JSON data, um, but the content doesn't matter at all. Uh, so basically your service will send some kind of JSON um, to OPA, for example, by the REST API um, or um, the Golang library or anything else. Then um, OPA will decide based on the policies, and we'll talk about this in a bit, um, whether it's allowed or it should be denied. Um, and then basically OPA will provide decision also as JSON back to my service. So this decision is also based on, on JSON data and it can contain everything. So it can be just on the true and false. Um, OPA can provide some more data if needed. So it's any kind of data in a JSON format. Um, furthermore, um, OPA has also some kind of, of data store um, where you can provide OPA with further information up front. So let's say if your request provides you with a part, but you need further um, information to really decide if this request is okay or not, um, you can provide OPA with some, some further um, data up front. This is basically this data store uh, down here. So this is basically how OPA works. If we now go a little bit into the details, um, Easy example, um, just based on an API authorization. So we have a post request on slush API um, with an authorization header called Nico. Um, so pretty easy example. And then basically our service sends to OPA um, our input data, which in this case is the method. We have the pass API and the user Nico. So based on this information, OPA then decides um, whether it's uh, okay or not. In this case, um, we do not have any further uh, more input data um, and OPA will just send back to our service the JSON was allowed true. And then basically our service knows, okay, this request is allowed, everything is fine and we can serve the data or something. Um, so this is basically just a just simple example. So now the only thing which is missing is, uh, um, is the policy part over here. Um, so talking about policy. As I said, um, OPA brings in uh, our own, uh, policy language. It's called Rego, um, and it's a declarative uh, language. So basically, you can ask questions. So you can ask, hey, is Nico allowed to post the payload to slash API, for example? Um, and then um, you can build your own queries. Um, the result of those, um, those policies can be true or false, which is a common approach, but you can also um, yeah, build anything further and give any kind of JSON data as feedback. So it's up to you. And to support you a little bit, um, Rego has some built-in functions um, 
it's one hundred forty and above. So it's basically time, date functions, string functions. You can use regex. Um, you can um, validate Java web tokens, uh, Java web tokens, for example, and and many many more. And here on the right, um, we have a um, sample, um, pretty easy sample um, rego policy. Um, which basically starts with a name. So basically the package, just the name, app.abac. Um, and we're defining that the default is false. So any kind, if there's no allow, it is false. And then we have a block, um, which is defined um, when um, the result is allowed. So basically when the action is opposed and the user is an owner. Um, and those both um, are um, declared below here. So here we're checking for the input, which is the input data, the service provides uh, Rego, and we're checking the method. Um, and if this is a post and the input user is Nico, um, then basically both will be allow uh, or both will be true. And because both are added to allow here, both need to be true. So if the request, uh, the method is post and the user is Nico, um, it's fine and Opa will say, okay, it's allowed. Um, so back to um, the full sample here. Um, as I said, the same post request, we're getting the same input data. As we see, it's po method post. So the input method is post, and the user is Nico here. Input user is Nico, which basically means um, both are true, and OPA will provide and allow um, is true back to our service. Now, this is basically how OPA works. Um, if you would like to get started with OPA, you have multiple options. So first of all, that's a pretty nice background. So it's a browser-based um, background where you can play with input data, output data. Um, you can build Rego queries. You will find examples. Um, so pretty nice point to really start and, and yeah, start and get ready to uh, yeah, to use OPA. So well, it's the OPA playground. Then we have pretty good docs. Documentation, we find all the details, how you build Rego policies and stuff like this. And of course, we have the OPA CLI, um, which is basically just the OPA binary where you can run OPA instance. You can test and validate your policies. Uh, and you also have an OPA evaluation, um, which is basically just a yeah, Swiss Army knife, which you can use to test and build and run OPA and stuff like this. And we will also use this one later in the, in the demo to integrate it with our CICD pipeline. But um, yeah, so these are just how everything works. But of course, we'd like to show you some, some stuff in, in, in action. Uh, we prepared two demos. Um, both are yeah, CACD integrated policy uh, policies with, with OPA. Um, I will talk um, or I'll show you in a sec um, how you can validate infrastructure as code changes um, with Terraform. So basically, you're introducing new, uh, new uh, cloud resources or update your cloud resources and then validate with OPA if those is okay and those is okay to, to deploy into your environments. Um, so let me switch to my to my demo here. Um, so I prepared a, a small a demo repo, um, pretty basic. So we have an infrastructure folder where we have a Terraform project, it's just one file. Um, so basically in this case, um, we are, would like to deploy to Azure. So I added the Azure provider here. Um, I de defined some uh, backend information where just there's a state file and stuff like this. So it's pretty um, pretty easy. Here we will use the Terraform integration with GitLab, uh, which means all the details, all the security stuff and stuff is injected from by GitLab side. So you don't need to do anything. Um, and then we have here the Azure Resource Manager provide, provider, doesn't matter at all. And we're creating two resources. So we have two resources from the kind Azure M resource group. So just a resource group in the Azure cloud. Um, we're creating two of them, one with the name example minus resource group and one with the name example denied resource group. Um, the first one is um, will be deployed to West Europe location and the second one to, to North Europe. So basically two resources, different name, different location. So if we now go back and have a quick look um, into our policies, we will have a terraform.rego file, which contains our Rego um, policy. As I said, we, first of all, we need a package name. Uh, we define it here. Then we I define two variables, basically, that I only want to check um, for resource groups in this example. And I would like to check if um, the location is West Europe. So I have two variables, one with the resource uh, type and one with the location I would like to check. 
So, and then I have basically um, the policy here. So first off, I'm getting um, yeah my input data and just store it in the change set here. Um, I only um, yeah input everything or store everything which is a resource change um, yeah to make it a little bit faster if it's uh, um, uh, a long list of of changes um, just to get the the change resources. Then I'm checking um, here if it's a trade um, or update action because it doesn't matter if it's a delete action. It doesn't matter for me or what the location was because the resource gets deleted. So also once again. Uh, for a big change to get it a little bit faster. So then basically two checks. So first of all, I'm checking the resource type, um, if it's the Azure resource group um, type, and then I'm checking after the change, um, the location, if this one matches West Europe, and if not, um, I'm, yeah, I'm getting a deny message. And then I'm defining the, the print. So basically here, resource group, but the name does not match allowed locations. Um, so basically, this is the Rego um, policy I defined. So we now check um, back in the um, in the root. Um, we're seeing um, the GitLab CI CD file, and here basically um, we have some some basics. So basically, we're including a template, which is um, yeah the Terraform integration in GitLab. So there's all the GitLab magic um, or Terraform matching happen. We need to define some variables and we have a list of stages. So we have an init and validate, which is used to yeah, to verify our code and um, to build everything up and running with Terraform needs. Um, this is all part of the template. Um, same for the deploy, which is really then deploying our um, our changes, which is also completely um, yeah, part of the template above here. So the only things we customized is we customized the build stage and we added another stage, which is called analyze. So in the build stage, um, the important part is that we're doing a Terraform show um, and convert converting this output um, into a JSON file. And this JSON file basically contains all the changes in this Terraform run. And this will be our input for, for OPA. And then we're putting this into artifacts that we'll have it available later. And then we have the analyst stage. And here we are just saying, hey, we would like to run the step in a container image. We're just using the open policy agent uh, container image. We need to use the debug um, image to have a shell in the container, um, overwriting the entry point, and then calling OPA um, with evil. We're saying, hey, we would like to have a pretty uh, output format. Um, and we would like to fail if we get any kind of output. So if everything is fine, we will do not get any output. And if there is an issue, um, we will get the output and the exit code of OPA um, will be false, which then basically stops the pipeline or brings the pipeline to red. And then we're telling um, where the policy is located and where the input um, JSON is related. So basically the Terraform uh, changes from above. And then we're just calling the package, data Terraform analysis uh, deny. And basically, this runs our um, our pipeline. And if we now check back into our pipelines, um, we have some some runs. Um, and maybe seen here um, the init stage passed, the validation state passed, the build stage passed. We maybe have a quick look in the build stage, and we've seen um, Terraform um, mentioned that there will be two resources created our resource group example, as well as our resource group um, example denied with the location North Europe. So if we now jump over to the analyze stage, and the, this one is red, um, basically what is now is happened that this um, stage will run OPA, the command I showed you some seconds before, and then provide us with an output and say, hey, the resource group example denied does not match the load location. So basically, um, the resource group with West Europe is fine, um, but the resource group with North Europe is not uh, with North Europe is not in West Europe, and we will get the output here. Um, we are able to fix it um, and make sure that this resource group gets not deployed into our um, yeah cloud environment. Okay, so with this, back to you. Thanks, Nico. That was a great demo. Today we have another uh, demo for you with regards to GitLab project validation. 
it's an initiative that I'm working on currently at GitLab. Um, the goal is to track and monitor all the projects and components that are involved in the development of GitLab at some point. And so we added recently some policies uh, in this inventory to make sure that the configuration of the projects is the one that we're expecting. So that's what we have here in this um, merge request. Um, first of all, uh, we need the project with a product category. So the categories are a way to add some tags or to label the projects. And obviously we want to uh, track the ones that are product related. So uh, this is not a real world example. Uh, of course, it's just for the sake of this demo. Uh, but you can see that we also have a projects.rego file where um, there is a violation rule here uh, that is true if the project is either a product project or as red data or is a library and there's any of the product violations that is listed above this. And the product violations are, uh, in this case, we want to make sure that SAST is configured. So there's a violation if SAST is not configured um, or SAST is disabled, for example, that's a violation. If the, the job is configured correctly, but we're not running it, that's a violation of our policy. And so the same goes for dependency scanning, secret detection, and so on. And uh, we can ensure that SAST is configured if we have at least one report of type, ta of type SAST in the pipeline. Um, the second rule set that we have here, the sites.rego uh, file, is to assess the websites that are uh, listed in this inventory because we also uh, link the websites that we deploy to their projects in this inventory. And we use this list to actually run some uh, SSL checks. After this uh, check, we are able to provide an overall grade from A to F. And of course, we want this grade to be great. We want this grade to be at least an A, so it could be A minus A or A plus, but nothing else. If it's not at least the A, there's here a violation and we'll report that. So if we get back to this uh, merge request pipeline, you can see that everything is green by comparison to the previous demo. That's because um, this pipeline is used to process the data. So we're thinking the, the data with uh, GitLab.com, we're updating the files, we're doing a SSL check, we're doing a lot of different things. And there's this new stage compliance where OPA is running, but OPA is green because there's nothing wrong with what the user is doing is in this pipeline. We're just using the pipeline to process the data again. But here we can see that we have some violations, actually. Uh, this new project that we just uh, categorized as a product project is uh, violating our policies because SAST is not configured, dependency scanning is not configured as well, and uh, neither is secret detection. And as for the websites, we can see that this one is OK, but this one is a B grade, which is obviously something that we don't want. So we report that here. We obviously don't use this output uh, just for debugging. We're providing some uh, JSON files uh, as a form of artifacts here. And these JSON files are going to be used later on to uh, generate alerts and issues so that we can fix the situation. So as we've just seen, there are many ways to use OPA. Um, they are a lot of different use cases. It could be for validating a Kubernetes manifest. It could be for building a nullow and deny list for your library dependencies, for example. That's something that can run directly in your CI CD pipeline. In comparison, you can run OPA as a diamond and do authorization for Docker, Envoy, or many other different use cases. Uh, we clearly invite you to uh, visit the OPA website, the openpolicyagent.org website for all the integrations that are already available for uh, this project. It's uh, amazing to see um, all these integrations. And with that, we hope that uh, OPA is a bit more clear for you today. And obviously, you want to enhance your compliance and governance with policy-based CI-CD. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out, direct out uh, directly to us. And we wish you a very good rest of your GitLab Commit conference. Bye, all. Bye-bye.